Hello, I am uh, Erika Roe and I am uh, a member of IAFI's Online Events Organization Committee. It is my pleasure today to welcome you at this third IAFI's fireside chat on feminist economics double special issue on COVID-19. Let me remind you that you can find the recordings of all previous virtual events on IAFI's YouTube channel channel. Today we will discuss four unique contributions investigating from different perspectives the organization of care in light of COVID-19. We will focus on how the organization of care has been affected and reconfigured by the current pandemic, including childcare and elder care, and comparing the different impact of the pandemic across the globe with insights from the Global North and the Global South. Now, I would like to welcome the speakers, Saskia Duj, uh, Elena Moore, Sara Stevano, Nina Tisdale, and Julia Zakia, and the moderator, Isa Stone Zuazu. Before starting, let me briefly introduce each of them. Saskia Duj, is a PhD student from the Department of Ethics, Law and Humanities at the Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands. She is currently working on, a peer, on her PhD thesis supervised by Dr. Petra Verdonk and Prof. Tineke Agma on the health and well-being of paid and unpaid caregivers in the residential long-term care sector and is doing so from an intersectional perspective. Elena Moore is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Cape Town. She's the author of Divorce, Family and Emotion Work and Reform and Customary Marriage, Divorce and Secession in South Africa. Her work has appeared in the Critical Social Policy Journal of Family Issues, Gender and Societies, Family, Relationship and Societies, and the Journal of Southern African Studies. She is co-editor of Families, Relationships and Societies. Her current research focuses on intergenerational relationships in South Africa, focusing on how people in multi-generational households negotiate kin support and responsibilities. Sara Stevano is a development and feminist political economist. She is a lecturer in economics at SOAS, University of London, after holding teaching and research position at the University of the West of England, Bristol, and King's College, London. Her areas of studies are the political economy of labor, food, and social reproduction. Her focus on Africa, uh, with primary research experience in Mozambique and Ghana. Nina Tisdale is a research fellow at Glasgow Caledonians Wise Centre for Economic Justice, which is based in Scotland. Central to her research interests are gender-related inequalities in employment and organisations, and the reconciling of paid work and unpaid care responsibilities. She is particularly interested in how legislation and policies such as flexible working and family related arrangement can help shape and influence and drive changes to gender relation and support social and economic justice. Along with two colleagues at WISE and colleagues based in South Africa, she's helping to develop with the support of Global Challenges Founding, a network of gender researchers undertaking comparative work on gender, care, family and employment issues in the Global South and North. Julia Zakia is a research fellow in economics at the Department of Statistics of Sapienza University of Rome. She collaborates with Minerva Laboratory of Gender Diversity and Gender Inequality. 
Her research interests extend to social and financial inclusion, gender economics, and gender gaps in labor markets and in academia. Her ongoing research projects are on the impact of sexual harassment on wage gaps and on the identification of the contribution of women to the development of the economic thought, trying to remove the ignorance about who were the women pioneers in economics. She is a member of the Young Scholars Member Committee of AYAFI. Isa Skunzuazu holds a PhD in economics from the University of Basque Country and is a postdoctoral research at the Institute for Socioeconomic, University of Duisburg, Essen in Germany. Her current work focuses on three main topics, gender gaps in political ideology, gender segregation and technological chance and sexual harassment in the workplace. During the pandemic, she has been on maternity leave. And now I leave the floor to Isa Schoon and I remind you that at the end of the interview, there will be around 15 minutes from Q&A from the public. Everybody is welcome to post their questions in the chat and the moderator will read them for, for you to the speakers. Thank you again for joining us today. Isa Schoon. Thank you so much, Erika, for your wonderful introduction and thank you all your, the, contribu the contributing authors for being here and uh, enable us to discuss your contributions with, uh, with us at the audience. So as it emerged from previous uh, discussions uh, in the IFE online events and elsewhere from the last spring, this crisis provoked by the uh, COVID pandemic overlap and interact with a set of pre-existing inequalities in terms of gender, race, and class uh, at both the, host, the household and labor market level. So I would like to ask uh, San Estebano to tell us more about these pre-existing inequalities uh, from an inter, uh, interdisciplinary, uh, sorry, uh, from a intersectional uh, perspective and how the pandemic has transformed and evolved these inequalities. Thank you so much, uh, Isa Skun, for engaging with our work and for this uh, thoughtful question. And uh, let me just say that I'm very pleased to be here and uh, the answer I'm going to provide is based on uh, um, a paper that we are very uh, honor to have in uh, this double special, special issue in feminist economics uh, that I wrote uh, with Alessandra Mezzadri, Lorena Lombardotti, and Hannah Bargawi. So these pre-existing inequalities, I think for us, they, it was very important to try to understand how the COVID-19 crisis uh, sort of intervened uh, on a situation that was already extremely vulnerable and precarious, uh, not least uh, from a feminist perspective. And we have conceptualized uh, the COVID-19 crisis as a crisis of work, uh, both productive and reproductive. Um, and uh, we saw the COVID-19 crisis uh, acting as a magnifying lens, a magnifying glass uh, for uh, pre-existing inequalities of uh, gender, but also class and race. And we think that uh, the way in which uh, these inequalities have been uh, um, somehow magnified, uh, reproduced and distorted in different ways uh, can be best seen if we reflect on these inequalities uh, in households uh, and also in the world of work, where in fact households and the world of work uh, are uh, interconnected, uh, as many feminists uh, have been arguing for a very long time. So before I get to say a couple of things on uh, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis, I would like uh, to start uh, with these uh, pre-existing inequalities. So what are we talking about? So what are these elements of uh, vulnerability and fragility? And so we know very well as feminist economists uh, that households uh, um, in uh, the neoliberal uh, time uh, have become increasingly responsible for welfare provisioning. And this is something that in the global north uh, uh, has been characterized uh, as uh, the uh, privatization or reprivatization of social reproduction, as put by Isabella Bakker, um, with a retreat of the state uh, from uh, welfare provisioning. 
Uh, this happened to some extent also in some contexts of the global south, uh, but uh, in the global south uh, there are many contexts uh, where the state was never um, uh, particularly present in subsidizing social reproduction or taking up uh, some aspects of social reproduction. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, during neoliberalism, we've seen uh, a complication and fragmentation of social reproduction in the global south uh, with uh, uh, families uh, seen uh, uh, germ means uh, to ensure social reproduction being eroded uh, uh, through uh, phase, the phase of uh, neoliberal globalization. But also an important uh, uh, cross-cutting process uh, that I think is very relevant uh, from the perspective of social reproduction and thinking about multiple inequalities is that of financialization, um, which is of course uh, very present in the global north and increasingly in many contexts of the global south. So households are not only responsible for welfare provisioning, but uh, they're also in the need of becoming increasingly indebted in order to do so. And uh, uh, of course, uh, this can be understood uh, uh, if we see also what has happened in the world of work uh, alongside this, uh, which is, uh, uh, to put it in simple terms, the very broad processes of uh, precarization and uh, casualization, uh, informalization of labor, uh, which of course, again, as feminists, uh, we know that uh, um, uh, these processes have gone hand in hand with the feminization of labor, uh, particularly in the global south. And uh, we're now in a position of recognizing that it's the West following the rest uh, in terms of informalization and precarization rather than the other way around. And uh, this has meant uh, that particularly for workers in the global South at the bottom of uh, global supply chains, uh, there has been a phenomenon of uh, adverse incorporation into global value chains. Uh, um, or even expulsions from global production networks, which has created uh, uh, several problems in terms of uh, meeting the imperatives of social reproduction. Um, and of course, uh, you know, all of this uh, in the, the context of the vast and persistent informality in which we know that many workers, uh, uh, particularly in the global south, uh, but increasingly uh, no longer so uh, only, um, uh, they don't have access to any form of social protection, social safety nets, and so forth. And so this is to say, when we think about uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, uh, this is a crisis that has hit the world uh, in a moment where uh, the situation was already very precarious uh, in uh, many ways. And uh, um, in terms of thinking about how the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, impacted this uh, uh, landscape of uh, pre-existing inequalities and fragilities, uh, in our paper, we have highlighted two key dynamics. Uh, the first is uh, the intensification of social reproduction work um, taking place uh, in households uh, primarily. And of course, in light of what I was saying earlier, this is uh, an exacerbation of a process uh, that uh, was already ongoing for decades uh, uh, across the world. Uh. And uh, on the other hand, the second dynamic is a shift of balance uh, between uh, sectors of the economy considered to be low skilled uh, uh, or low value producing and the sectors of the economy considered to be high skill, where of course we know that uh, women uh, black and brown people, migrants, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, uh, are over and uh, working class people uh, more generally are overrepresented in the so-called uh, low-skilled sectors of the economy, which then have been rebranded as essential. Um, but so, just to take the example of the stay-at-home policies. Uh, uh, I mean, it is very clear to all of us, and uh, uh, many of us have been saying this, uh, uh, that uh, the stay-at-home policies have not meant the same for everyone. Um, and so to start with, uh, some people could not stay at home. So in some cases, these workers uh, ha were classified as essential, um, which meant that they got uh, some social recognition and, 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 and praise. But in terms of material uh, uh, gains, uh, there was absolutely nothing there. And in fact, uh, in addition to not receiving any material uh, benefits or gains, uh, uh, these workers have been overly exposed to the disease. And so this is important to recognize. Other workers became unemployed and some lucky ones uh, like myself um, could uh, shift their work from home. Um, uh, so it is evident that depending on occupations uh, to start with, uh, we have been impacted by this crisis very differently. Um, 
and uh, working class people, black and brown people, women and migrants uh, are overrepresented uh, among both uh, the essential workers uh, and those who became unemployed. So there is uh, this uh, uh, double negative effect uh, uh, in economically or in health terms that we need to consider. So through employment, uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has created an equal impact on grounds of class, race, uh, gender, and migration status. Uh. And of course, the, um, I just used the example of employment, uh, but uh, we can think along similar lines uh, in terms of who we live with uh, and where, so household composition and housing conditions in general, how we access healthcare, and uh, what kind of underlying health conditions we have, uh, whether we have caring responsibilities, of course, uh, and how we access means of transport. So these are all channels uh, through which uh, multiple inequalities have intensified uh, during the pandemic. And of course, uh, the impacts on workers uh, at the origins of global supply chains uh, and uh, in the informal economies, uh, often uh, there are some overlaps between these two groups have been catastrophic and there is a lot of evidence that can document that. So just to conclude, uh, um, I think something that has emerged very strongly from this uh, double issue um, in feminist economics, which is wonderful, is that, of course, women uh, are considered to be at a lower risk of COVID-19 uh, uh, mortality, uh, but they have been impacted disproportionately uh, through their concentration in jobs exposed to the disease, uh, increased care needs, uh, unemployment and domestic violence. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, this has not been the same for all women, which is why uh, we need to think about inequalities uh, in an intersectional way. So I'll stop there and I hope I haven't taken too much time. It was perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your thoughtful uh, depiction of the uh, current situation of uh, pre existing and transform inequalities due to COVID. I would like to open uh, the floor for all the other contribute, uh, contributing authors in case they want to add something to what Sarah already said. Otherwise, okay, otherwise uh, we can move our focus towards more specific aspects of the organization of care. Uh, um, we, we all know that that the care has been uh, particularly affected by the uh, COVID-19. Uh, I'm referring specifically to the dramatic uh, mortality rates in nursery homes and also how social distancing policies have isolated elderly people from the rest of the society. So I will ask, I would like to ask uh, Saskia Dobbs. Uh, uh, more on these uh, terms, uh, more on this topic on how the pandemic have impact on the provisioning of elderly care. Based on your research, uh, Saskia, what are the impacts for elderly, uh, sorry, elder care workers? And whether you have found differences between workers in terms of their contracts, whether you, you found differences between employees or self-employers in the elder care sector? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely question. But before I'm going to answer it, I'm going to thank you for the invitation of having me here and thank you for organizing this. It's really special to publish an article in a special issue and then have these conversations amongst each other. So that's really, really valuable. And uh, so thank you very much. And also thank you uh, uh, Sarah, because I think Sarah uh, Stefana really outlined uh, the context in which our empirical uh, study is placed. So, um, and especially because you describe how, how social inequalities are really uh, intensified and uh, exacerbated in the pandemic. And I think our empirical study is really um, elaborates on, on your work. So um, thank you so much. And then to, to answer your question, yeah, we, we wrote a paper, um, uh, we published a paper together with uh, Petra Verdonk, who's also here, and um, Anouk Hademakers, who was uh, my intern at the time, who was a very lucky intern to have a paper published immediately. So I'm very proud also of her work. Um, and uh, Zora uh, Burek, my colleague, and uh, Tineke Verdonk. And together we, we wrote this paper and it's part of my broader PhD project on, I was already doing some work on um, uh, elderly care workers or so workers within elderly care. Um, and we had already done a study about freelance elderly care workers because uh, I think that context needs to be 
um, uh, described that in the Netherlands, more and more elderly care workers opt for self-employment. They, they, they opt out of being an employer within a care institution, but start working as a self-employed care worker. And we had been following these care workers for a while already when the pandemic hit. And this paper is really, um, uh, in this paper, we really present the impact the uh, pandemic had on these freelance elderly care workers. And to share a little bit about what happened with them, we, we called our paper um, Push to the Margins and Stretch the Limits. And that's really about um, their experience that when the pandemic hit, uh, freelance care workers who often work at different places uh, it were immediately confronted with the precariousness of their care work, their paid care work. They were kept out of workplaces. Many uh, freelance care workers lost shifts um, uh, and experienced the financial precariousness of working as a freelancer. Um, quickly, uh, many, many shifts uh, opened up for freelancers, but they were at the more risky places, that meaning the places in which um, hired employees felt scared to work or opted out of work because they, they were a risk group themselves or cared for someone in a risk group um, or already fell ill. So freelancers quickly had more work, but then at the risky shifts. And we really describe in our paper what that meant for them because they were, I think that is important to, to note, they really felt unprotected by um, elderly care institutions or uh, social policies. Because when the pandemic hit, we had very little, uh, I think uh, all around the globe, we had very little um, uh, personal protective equipment. And in the Netherlands, the, the national government, they really took uh, control in an unprecedented way of the redistribution of personal protective equipment, um, which was then prioritized in, in intensive care units and then the elderly care um, sector was, was more or less on the bottom of the hierarchy. And then uh, freelancers in elderly care did not profit from this. They could not access these nationally uh, redistributed personal protective equipments. They could not access like uh, social policies protecting them um, from the financial adversities that other freelancers, for example, had. And also many felt unprotected by the care institutions and some even said we are hired to protect their higher employees if that's true or not we don't know but that was at least the feeling among um, freelancers that they really had to work the the risky shifts to protect people who were employees who were also that let us say suffering from the impacts of the pandemic um and uh, to to add to sarah's story already in in this context, um, many, many paid and um, many paid care workers, many freelancers really experienced harsh dilemmas. And in these personal moral dilemmas uh, in which they had to choose between working risky shifts or protecting uh, someone they cared for, choosing between working risky shifts um, or choosing between protecting the health of your son with asthma by not working, but then, then facing the fear of indebtment at the other side. These were really harsh dilemmas. And in our paper, we really describe how in these dilemmas, pre-existing social inequalities uh, or inequities became visible. So the more pr financially privileged ones could, uh, could afford to protect themselves while those who were in less financially privileged uh, situations really sometimes could not even afford a dilemma, could not even uh, uh, opt out of care work. So that's kind of the, 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 the empirical um, findings we describe in our paper. And you, you asked me a different question. So what are the differences between hired employees and, and self-employed care workers, at least in the Dutch uh, context? Um, and we did not really elaborate on that in our paper, but we've been following care workers for a longer time um, in, in this pandemic, and we recently had another round of interviews with uh, those paid care workers, and then we really see um, that both freelancers and uh, both self-employed and hired employees really suffer from the lack of attention, lack of resources, lack of 
um, uh, appreciation for the elderly care sector and the reproductive work that is going on there, but they do suffer from it in different ways. So I think um, many hired employees, they, they uh, uh, felt protected by social policies that enabled them to, to have sick leave benefits, uh, for example, or could go with sick leave benefits if they cared for someone who, who was ill, but they really suffered from the moral, moral appeals, uh, the really gendered moral appeals from their employers to come to work, even if they were sick, because there were so many um, uh, elderly care workers uh, who were at home being sick. Um, so that's, I think, really char characterizes the uh, experience of the hired employees. When it comes to the freelancers, again, you really see the divide between the uh, financially privileged ones who, who initially opted for self-employment as a health strategy, as a way to continue to work in elderly care while also protecting their own health. Um, uh, and the financially privileged ones could exert their autonomy over their health. They could decide which kind of shifts they wanted to work, where they wanted to work, if they wanted to work. So there was the autonomy of self-employment that really um, uh, uh, protected their health. But if we look at the freelancers and the, especially the ones in financial precarious situations who are also often the younger racialized women who uh, opted out. Um, and there we are again uh, with the pre-existing inequalities uh, Sarah Stefano described, who already opted out of being a hired employee due to experiences of racism in the workplace, who were then younger, did not have often did not have uh, um, major financial buffers. Um, and I recently spoke to one of the, the, the freelancers who worked like 50 shifts in a row, uh, 10 hours a day uh, to, to, to maintain herself, uh, which was really, who really paid the price in terms of health for her, uh, her paid care work. So I did, to eliminate a little bit of the different dynamics between hired employees and um, paid care workers, but both suffer in terms of health uh, and in terms of their informal caring responsibilities and financial security. Um, to give you a, a first answer. Thank you so much, Saskia, for your thoughtful uh, response to my question. Uh, so digging deeper into the, the role of uh, elderly care, and the organization of uh, care work, we often see uh, elderly, um, elderly care, I mean, sorry, el uh, elderly people as care takers, as is in the case of a Saskia uh, contribution. Uh, but uh, the role of elderly people in uh, as care givers is undeniable, uh, as the pandemic has demonstrated. Uh, is specifically when we think of grandparents provisioning childcare. So it's in this context uh, in which I, I would like to know more uh, from Elena Moore and Nina Tisdale about the impacts of COVID-19 crisis in the role of uh, grandparents in provisioning childcare and uh, income support to the rest of the household. Uh, for in your research, you focus on the cases of the UK and South Africa, and you find some cross-country differences in public support and also cultural norms uh, relating the uh, provision of childcare by grandparents. So I, I would like to, to I would like you to elaborate more on on these two uh, issues. And um, finally, uh, in your opinion. Do you think uh, in the aftermath of uh, the pandemic, grandparents' provisioning of childcare will be revalued in a way? Um, Elena or Gina, I give you okay. the floor. Thanks. Um, Mina, would you like to go first or should I? Um, is it okay if I just say something first? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to sort of echo, first of all, the other panellists by saying um, it's a real privilege, uh, for, if I may speak on your behalf, Elena, for us to be here today talking about our paper um, and for you to um, facilitate us 
talk about uh, intergenerational uh, independence and intergenerational support and the role and the very pivotal role of grandparents in uh, uh, providing ch childcare. Um, in terms of uh, your questions, um, I would like to just say uh, that the short answer is uh, that yes, grandparents' role in the provision of ch childcare has changed and yes, there has been uh, and there are differences uh, during and before the pandemic uh, grandpa the, of grandparents' role in informal care support in the two con country contexts. Um, very broadly, um, as we said in our paper, uh, the, the two countries differ in terms of poverty, employment, unemployment, uh, multi-generational living, uh, the prevalence of female-headed households, uh, the level of grandparent support in terms of not just childcare, but also household financial provision. And it's within these contexts, COVID-19 and the respective government lockdown measures have had uh, quite differing impacts. Uh, what is similar, though, is how crucial and pivotal intergenerational independence and intergenerational support is to individuals, families, communities and the very functioning of society and the economy. So in terms of the UK and the other uh, nations within the UK, uh, I think similar to uh, uh, well countries across the world, informal care provided by grandparents parents, to reiterate again, has always been crucial uh, to the economy and has allowed women and men to undertake paid employment. Uh, despite uh, its persistent lack of visibility and recognition, uh, this informal care provided by grandparents has been especially crucial in the UK in the context of very high formal child costs. The UK has some of the high, highest child costs care costs in Europe, if not the highest, and despite uh, the offering of part-time free entitlement for some preschool aged children, which was introduced in the late 1990s by the then Labour, new Labour government. Indeed, the childcare system has long been underfunded, it remains long underfunded. It's reliant on poorly paid staff, as all social care is, and it's very much lacking in formal provision for those working irregular hours or atypical hours. So many parents are really reliant on this informal support provided by grandparents as part of the jigsaw um, of care, especially those who are low, low paid or lone parents. So I would just, to get back to the question, say the key difference between, and Elena will say more on this, but the key difference between the UK um, to South Africa was the very much the temporary stopping or suspension of informal provision uh, by grandparents during the pandemic. And this really made starkly visible the crucial role of grandparents in formal support. And it also exposed the fragility, the complexity and the gaps in the existing childcare system in the UK and the cushioning of such gaps by informal childcare providers. And it became at least initially a key concern or worry for government. Indeed, the te temporary suspension of informal care support and stay at home message had multiple ramifications. So survey in evidence indicated, as we all know, that many work working parents, including key workers and poorly paid workers, were particularly hit uh, with this clearly influenced and shaped by gender and other intersecting inequalities of class race class and age um, and it led to the reducing of working hours by some some workers the taking up of unpaid leave and even some being forced to give up their jobs um, absorbing increasing so they could absorb the increasing levels of care work in the home um, as Saskia has emphasized in relation to elder care workers it also in gender dangers and health implications for the childcare workforce too, who were put in a very, very difficult position of having to put themselves potentially at risk and without adequate PPE. But there's been a real lack of understanding by government of the work of childcare professionals in the UK and their day-to-day -day close contact with young people. And very much here, I would say uh, there's been a reliance on a narrative of childcare workers, teachers, etc being told 
uh, by politicians that they've just got to roll up their sleeves and get on with it. Uh, the children's future is very much in their hands. So a lot of moral pressure has been put on them to, to, to continue their work, even in dangerous and risky circumstances. Um, childcare providers are now open again in the UK, but formal childcare usage has been very slow to bounce back. Um, and therefore, uh, a lot of uh, working parents are turning again, once again, to their informal support grandparents, other relatives, et cetera, uh, intensifying what they're doing. So at this point, I'll turn over to you, Elena, if you want to say a little bit about the South African picture. <laughs> Thanks, Nina. Uh, and hello to everyone. Good evening to everyone from here in Cape Town. And just like to reiterate again what Nina and others have said about hosting this fantastic um, gathering this evening. Um, I should also mention that our co-author, I see Sarah has joined us and is here as well. Um, and so we're delighted to write this piece together across the waters as such in, in what's harrowing conditions. I should emphasize that this pandemic is very much ongoing in South Africa, that you know we're to face a third wave probably in the coming weeks. And so whilst we talk about kind of reflections of what's been, there is you know far more to come potentially. So that's one thing. I suppose in relation to the question, what I would like to point out as well is what's actually been said by Sarah in the first instance and I think repeated by both speakers is that, you know, in the South African context, grandparents have been key caregivers and financial providers for a very long time. Their, dom you know, their role as dominant and primary caregivers increased during the HIV and AIDS pandemic. And that's where actually a lot of the scholarship was emphasizing the dangers of the exiting of the state in terms of provision of welfare and, and the kind of the burden of care that's left to be carried by women and particularly older women. So there's, there was warning signs not that far back, you know, um, in terms of what would happen in such pandemics or epidemics in that case. Um, but over increasingly over the last decade or two, the increase in female labor migration has played a critical role in, in grandparents. And I say grandparents and great grandparents as well. Um, play you know as being uh, key primary caregivers and of course this has a much longer history to it you know the process of apartheid and colonization with restrictive mobility of women um, and oppressive economic uh, and various illegal kind of restrictions where men and women were unable to be ha live to, unable to live with their children you know placed men women and their children and families in a very fragmented way However, the role of grandparents as income providers and key income providers kind of took off with the democratization of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of, of South Africa um, and the extensive rollout of social grants. And this was really important in the pandemic because as jobs were lost and as, you know, both in the informal economy and the formal economy, reliable sources of income were mainly social grants. Uh, the government stepped in in, in different ways and topped up you know, different types of social grants. But the one social grant that's quite a relative, and I say relatively high value, is the old age grant. And in a context where 90% of the population who are over 60 are receiving that old age grant, that again, you know, is three times high the amount of a child support grant, we see that the, 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 you know, the critical role that that high sum of money would play in a household at a time when jobs are being lost, particularly at a time when uh, there's a gendering of, of uh, the loss of employment taking place. So this, the rollout of the wider social protection and the top ups that took place with regards to the, you know, the state's provision of extra support in terms of finance and social grants was a real, was a real critical intervention by the state at that time. However, saying that, and in, in answering the kind of cross-country differences, I think Nina has alluded to them, that the provision of childcare in South Africa and the fact that women, um, you know, have been, ex have been primary caregivers, both of grandparents, great-grandparents, and other female kin for a very long time, you know, is operating in a context where two-thirds of all children live in multi-generational households. So therefore, this idea that, you know, children should be separate from older persons was never going to work and was never could never work. Um, the degree to which that plays out is difficult to tell at this particular moment. But 
what we did see was that there was a kind of a disadvantaging of certain women. So primary caregivers were excluded from receiving um, other social grants that were introduced, uh, grants that were akin to a basic income grant. And so here we see, you know, ways in which women were be being treated as caregivers and not citizens. On the flip side of that, or at the same time, you know, there's very little state support for childcare service provision uh, for zero to five year olds. So once, you know, once a child reaches six years old, they enter school system and there it's free schooling for there and after or free schooling. And in, you know, figures pre pandemic again show us that the, the number of children, over a million children from the age of three to five are not in accessing any service provision um, in terms of early child development, you know, creches or pre primaries across the country. Now, what we saw during the pandemic was the complete state neglect of financial support for early child support development centers. So the, the, the provision of care, um, both through their subsidies and the kind of inadequate and sometimes lacking um, forthcoming of subsidies, but also in terms of the ways in which such care provision had to be equipped with PPE um, and the lack of resources that, that people could do that with. As parents took their children out of, of, you know, of pre-primaries, the most um, pre-primaries or you know early child development centres actually closed, and we're still we're still still seeing the ramifications of that. And finally, to ask the, you know the one question you posed about whether grandparents and older persons will be revalued in the light of the pandemic, I, I know I seriously doubt it. Um, it's really unlikely, and there's three main reasons I would say for this. The first being that grandparents, as I said, pay, you know, have played a key service, both in terms of practical care and financial care in households in South Africa and in Southern Africa for decades, for you could say centuries. And the South African state cannot financially absorb this. And they can't you know, provide that kind of form of the, the degree of support, the level of care that is required. But secondly, the role has been enhanced or heightened with you know, the introduction of state support. So the ways in which households are formed in South Africa is really significant. So women headed households make up about 40% of households where in a context we have very low marriage rates, grandparents and particularly female kin are the reliable choice to partner with and to live with and to co-reside and manage childcare and you know, money in, in people's personal lives. And so that will continue. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, there is a cultural ethos of interdependency and being you know, a, good, a good granny. So whilst you know, this exists across the world in societies that, and communities that are more collective in nature, grandparents are less likely to reject the request to look after a child, to pay for a child if they can do so. And therefore, whilst it's not free of tension or conflict, you know, I think grandparents and great-grandparents are forevermore going to play a very critical role in both the provision of care and in um, uh, um, yeah, and, and, and the provision of income support as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nina and Elena. It was uh, tremendously interesting in the way you put the cross country differences between the UK and South Africa and knowing more about the situation in South Africa was hugely important. Uh, specifically with the background that Sarah uh, said at the beginning of our decision, this uh, depiction of the uh, of an intersection uh, intersectional inequality map and also the conjunction between the uh, paper of Saskia seeing um, the elderly people as take uh, sorry caretakers and your work Nina and, and Elena as elderly people as uh, caregivers it was hugely it was amazing and taking uh, stock uh, of your findings, Nina and Elena, um, of uh, these cross-country differences in the organization of care, specifically taking consideration of elderly care. Uh, in company with uh, Julia Sakia contribution, in which uh, she and her co-authors found uh, uh, important within country or regional level di uh, differences in uh, the responses of the uh, uh, to the pandemic, again, regarding early elderly care, and how these differences have driven to different outcomes uh, at the regional level. I would like to, to ask uh, Julia if there is a lesson that uh, we can learn from the, the outcomes that uh, COVID-19 has uh, 
had provided in early care provisioning in the pre existing uh, organization of elderly care, and also how norms and family habits uh, have played a role in the response of uh, the pandemic. So, Julia is. Yes, thank you so much, it's a school and, and uh, I will put also my piece on this uh, frame that I mean, uh, it's uh, really complete and so uh, let me say first of all that our article that I co authored with uh, Marcella Corsi that uh, is uh, uh, now in the participants uh, uh, side but also uh, by Erika Aloe. Uh, as you can imagine from my accent is about Italy. Uh, so Italy is, has been hit hard, uh, if you know, in the first part of the pandemic uh, by COVID-19, but what hit our attention, and I mean, this is what also is a strong stress, uh, is that uh, there are some regional differences in the severity of elderly mortality uh, during the peaks of this pandemic. In fact, the majority of deaths, more than the 18%, are concentrated in the north regions of uh, Italy. So it seems that uh, the historical dualism in Italy that uh, usually sees the northern regions of Italy more advanced than the south of the so-called Mezzogiorno in the formal labor market indicators and the, the GDP per capita indicators reversed uh, once we look at the resilience during the health crisis. So we investigated what protected elderly people from the pandemic in the South as compared to the Northern region of Italy. And we concentrated as uh, already just stressed on difference in family structures and in caring spirits uh, across the different regions of uh, Italy. Uh, we apply a SEMA model, so a structural learning model to time use data to investigate the complexity of what we call the social cohesion. So uh, the interdependence of family members for covering individual care needs, so that could be, of course, also emotional ones, and how this family cohesion can be correlated to the different elderly mortality rates during the first peak of the pandemic in the different regions of Italy. And I go straight to, I mean, the lessons learned because we identify three paths uh, that uh, we can assume and then we can see as uh, three lessons learned. First of all, a closer relationship across generations in families had a positive impact in protecting elderly from mortality. In fact, in the central north regions, more often elderly people live their lives in isolations or in nursing homes, and this is something that is connected, and so a nursing homes in Italy is failing to sustain a social reproduction, and this is the fact. A second path that we identify with uh, the data that we analyze and with our analysis of Italian countries is that the increase in mortality during the first peak of the pandemic was lower in areas where family cohesion is higher. And once more, family cohesion is a sort of intergenerational family obligations that induce an altruistic behaviors and altruistic preferences. In fact, uh, elderly people in the south of Italy spend with their own children almost the double the time that uh, elderly people in the central north do. A third path that we can, a third, a third lesson, let's say, that we can learn from our analysis is that, uh, and this is, I mean, a connection also with the last <laughs> paper that has been presented, is that there is a virtual a uh, cycle of, of intergenerational family care system since regions where elderly people devoted more time to care work are those regions with lower intensity and severity of COVID-19 pandemic. So I just want, I mean, to conclude so that we have time to discuss all together, but uh, what we found is that family cohesion, family structure, and the emotional, intangible, and not traditional economic aspect of intra-household practices of care 
can explain a part of the differences in the intensity and the severity of COVID-19 pandemic in the Italian regions. So family cohesion has become a new feature for rethinking with feminist lenses this time, the North-South dualism in Italy that sort of deserves much more attention also in the wake of the recovery plan. And we hope to give also our contribution in that. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julia, for your answer. Uh, I would like to open the floor to the other contributors or the, the, the other contributing authors in case they want to add something to what Julia has said. Thank you, Otherwise. Thank you, Jasku. No, it's fine, absolutely. And time is running, so better to open the debate in case. Thank you much, anyway. So, um, thank you, Marcella. Uh, so, in order to uh, have uh, provide some time for the audience to, to uh, elaborate their questions, I would like to ask all the contribution, the contributing actors uh, a question that uh, can, can uh, answer. So transversal to all your contributions is the key issue of the under measurement and the definition of what constitutes productive and reproductive uh, activities in the academy. So I would like to know uh, in which ways your, your findings and your uh, theoretical contributions help to rethink and theorize what constitutes uh, reproductive and productive activities. And uh, in which ways we can rethink of the, the uh, uh, mis we can redesign measures to better take account of the economy. So, Following uh, an alphabetical order, Saskia Doss, you want to add something on that realm? Yes. Well, I, 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 I had a little bit of a, a hard time answering your question. How can we measure it, it better? How can we measure reproductive work better? But I think in our work, we, we really used to, um, in our paper, we used the work of uh, Nancy Fraser. Um, and uh, Rahel Jaggi, uh, I see Sarah already uh, nodding her head, and that really helped. Their work really helped me to to understand um, the what she calls the boundary struggles that were going on between production and reproductive work. Uh, and we really, in our paper, saw that how freelancers were really found themselves at the nexus of these boundary struggles. So, um, for example, in the Netherlands. Um, uh, and I think that that is around the globe, at least in the in the, the global north, that there were austerity austerity measures after the 2008 financial um, crisis that really um, uh, led to budget cuts in elderly care, which were enacted by policies that that rendered social reproduction to the to the realm of uh, households and informal care rather than something that we as society value uh, and, and want to pay for. So social reproduction was really, at least in the Netherlands, and I think other contributors might have the same experience in their context, it was really framed as something that costs us as society, that is too costly, and it needs to be taken up by informal caregivers. Um, and at least in the pandemic, that really, like that shift of pushing back uh, reproduction to the realm of informal care, um, Exurbit, exurbit, uh, made the dilemmas of freelancers larger because they were more responsible for unpaid care uh, as well as had to attend to more and in complex care uh, at work. So their dilemmas were really enlarged by those policies, I would argue. So that's not really an answer to your question. I'm sorry about it, but maybe um, an answer to a different question that needs to be asked now. It was likewise interesting. Thank you so much, Saskia. So if other of our speakers want uh, to uh, add something. Yeah, maybe. I mean, actually, we um, we had the opportunity also to measure instead the value of these uh, intra-household care practices and regimes. Um, and this is thanks to uh, the time use 
data. So I want to stress here the importance of uh, collecting and using in the right way this time use a survey that are I mean, uh, the instruments that we can use to let them visible the unpaid care work inside the family and also for uh, the other. Uh, so let me stress a little bit, I mean, uh, of uh, some conclusions and something that, I mean, we have learned also uh, from this pandemic is that it's even more urgent right now, a call for uh, data feminism. And for data feminists, I, um, I uh, think of a way uh, and it's not me, of course, I mean, it's a movement that uh, think about data, uh, about their use, their collections, but also their limits of the data that uh, are, these data are informed by commitment to actions, by intersection of feminist perspective and thought, by considering contexts. And I mean, we have seen that also inside Italy, that is quite a small country. We have a lot of difference inside our territory and we have to consider all these kind of differences. And also, I mean, data that make all work visible. And one last thing that I want to put on the table is that, I mean, uh, actually what uh, COVID-19 stress is that care and I mean, look at our paper, elderly care must be a political concern. Uh, so actually um, we should prioritize and we should fight for uh, a discourse, a public discourse about the proper way to provide care, uh, to finance care, to provide the rights to, to, to who, I mean, provide cares and receive care but also most important uh, to the quality of care. <laughs> that, I mean, is something that is crucial and we saw how important it is. Thank you, Julia, uh, for your response. Uh, I, I will um, use the last couple of minutes to, uh, to ask a question by uh, Susan Himmelbeit. To what extent did the freelancers really choose to be freelance? I guess this is a question for Saskia. Yes, I was already starting to answer it in the chat. I'm sorry. Um, well, uh, the short answer would be also time-wise that there's a paper coming up that's uh, actually really attending to that question. Um, but the main point is that um, it's not. It's a choice that is made against the backdrop of an elderly care sector that's already under pressure shaped by uh, other societal experiences. I already touched a little bit upon experiences of racism that really push people into freelance work as a strategy to, to protect themselves and their own health. So just a tiny answer to that question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Saskia. And I'll be, I mean, I will use the last minute uh, to thank you all for your amazing uh, papers. I, I, I really enjoyed uh, your, your, and, and learn big time from your papers and also uh, reading them all together uh, provide a, uh, an amazing understanding of the pre-existing inequalities in terms of gender, class and, uh, and race and also the key issue of elderly care. So I would like to remind you that uh, the next uh, first side chat will be on May 26th. And we will have the editors of the uh, the upcoming handbook of feminist economics. Uh, thank you so much for our speakers and also the audience. It was uh, an amazing morning, evening, and afternoon. Uh, thank you. <laughs>